excited about what I will discuss what I will discuss with you all today, and it's how to create engaging lessons through virtual formats. I would like to tell you that this is based on my own experience over the last two years working with students and also working uh, with teachers in professional development and also supporting teachers in Honduras and in different places in Latin America to uh, better cater to the needs of students and to create that same, not the same, but a similar ambience as the one that we have when we are in person, which we know that, that it's totally different, right? It's a totally different context and a totally different situation. But it is possible to create those engaging lessons and it is possible to create those engaging virtual environments. So just to give you an idea of what will happen during the next 40 minutes, I will talk to you about why should we engage in virtual environment? And, and, and maybe I don't need to tell you because the last two years have taught us that it's a need and we were pushed into this a little bit quicker than we had thought possible. I will tell you a little bit about the advantages that I found in my experience and the disadvantages. I will talk to you about some strategies that I put in place, some tools that I used. And I will also, if we have enough time and, and, and my time management works well, then I will let you experience some of the tools that I used during this encounters that I had with students and teachers. So going online, why? Well, because of the pandemic, we had to very quickly go virtual, right? But also in terms of thinking of other contexts and other situations in our realities, and especially for us uh, in Latin America, it closed the gap for access to those that have connectivity, right? The, to those have, that have access to connectivity and that might otherwise find it a little bit difficult to attend a course that is in another place, but that they are interested in, or for a teacher to attend a training or a conference in, in an international place. This made it a little bit cheaper because you had the connectivity, you didn't have to pay for a hotel, you didn't have to pay for travel, and it's relevant. However, if we think about that, then it also further increased the gap for those without connectivity. And when I, when I think about our country where we have in rural areas especially, that even if we could provide them with connectivity, they don't have access to electricity all the time, then that limits the access. But then there is where we saw the creativity of teachers to come up with alternatives that needed not, that didn't need connection to the internet all the time, but that could be done through low bandwidth platforms such as WhatsApp or Telegram or sometimes LMS, a learning management system that was low bandwidth that you could be online sometimes and offline sometimes. So this also increased the creativity of teachers. So it closed the gap for those with connectivity, but even when it increased the gap for those without connectivity, creative alternatives were put into place. So it is still possible to go online and it is still important to go online because it's a matter of access to information and to professional growth. Now, what are some of the advantages that I found in this process? Well, I found that we could reach people all over the country. We could have students that could connect if, via their phones or via a device and that uh, could have access to their continue their learning, continue their 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 school, their university, and we were able to reach them all at once, the teacher being in one place and the students being all over the country. But it also allowed worldwide reach, right? So I could do a training with teachers in Nicaragua or in Argentina or in Italy or in Morocco, for example, or like right now in Korea, right? So it also provides teachers with tools that are virtual, but that can be implemented in the classroom. And not only use the virtual tools as such, but be able to adapt and to, to their own contest. And when I talk to you about the tools, I will give you some examples of ad adaptations that teachers have done in places where there's no uh, connectivity all the time. It also allows educators to have a portfolio of tools that they could use either for teacher training or for student uh, development. And I think this is what I found most valuable. And it is that it provided the teachers 
with hands-on experience and they, it allowed them to actually experience the tool before actually implementing in the classroom. And then they could understand the frustrations or anticipate the frustrations or the challenges or the difficulties or complexities that students could experience when they would use the online tool. And then they could anticipate and mitigate situations. So I think from all the advantages, this is what I found to be the most relevant from those experiences. When we think about disadvantages, of course, it requires connectivity most of the time. But there are adapt adaptations, there are alternatives that we can look into and that we can uh, provide for our teachers and for our students. This is important. It requires practice and some basic technological knowledge. And depending on the context where you are, people might be knowledgeable of technology or not and they can have some basic skills or they would need to develop that. So whenever we incorporate virtual tools or a virtual environment, we need to take that into consideration, that it would require having that, and, and a lot of patience. And when I have been developing these sessions online, I have uh, incorporated that amount of patience that comes naturally to us teachers because we are usually very patient people and very flexible and very uh, adapt and we adapt to situations. But I found that it required more of my patience here because I needed to create a safe environment not only for students, but I found that when doing professional development with teachers, I needed to create that safe environment for them too. Because teachers could also stress out when trying to learn how to use the tool. And this uh, made them feel a little bit stressed and not being able to ha go at the same rhythm as the other teachers really created an anxiety. And I had to be very careful at creating a safe space where I, where I told them, if this doesn't come naturally the first time, don't worry, we're going to practice, we're going to do it all over again. And if it doesn't work, I will uh, work one on one with you. And that created that safe space for learning and that possibility of them feeling confident that if, even if they didn't get it at the time that we were using it, they would get it afterwards. It also requires careful planning and it means that you need to we plan normally when we are teaching a class, but when we are using uh, the virtual context, we need to make sure that we are planning and we're making sure our participants, our learners, our teachers are engaged. And it requires following up on that. And I will tell you a little bit about when I talk to you about the strategies. It requires, of course, additional materials, and especially having tutorials or making sure you have a video uh, demonstrating how to use the tool and a little bit more time from you as a teacher, if you prepare this for your students, to get a feel of the tools and the potential challenges that you might have when using them. So what were some of the strategies that I used? And, and, and we're gonna use some of them, some, we're gonna use some of the tools and you will see a little bit of what I have used them for, a little bit of tiny experience that we will have with them, but that you can adapt easily into your, into your practice. But breakout rooms. Now, with breakout rooms and with Zoom, we know that this is usually abused. So, uh, well, okay, we're going to do, let's go into a breakout room. Let's go into a breakout room, right? And then if you do that too often when you're in the virtual environment, then your students are going to get a little bit bored of, ah, oh, we're going into a breakout room again. So it means that you need to vary the amount of strategies that you use and what happens in those breakout rooms too, right? Have clear instructions, use different tools when they are there, use it for specific things that you want them to do on their own, that you want them to practice on their own. So we need to be very uh, intentional on why we're using the breakout rooms. I also incorporated in the process silent reading and silent listening individually. So I would give them an, er an excerpt of a document in a Google Doc or in a PDF file, and I will tell them, okay, we're going to go off camera for the next 10 minutes, and you have 10 minutes to, it depends on how long the excerpt or the article was, but it would be 10 minutes to either scheme or scan and get the gist of the information, or 10 minutes to actually read the two paragraphs that I would give them. Or it would be a short video, 
that uh, they would have to listen to. And maybe it would be a two to three minute, five minute maximum video that they would listen to. And then they would write three bullets about what the video was about or answer some guided questions that I would have for them. Then I also did group reading and group listening. And I either did that in a breakout room or I did that through a WhatsApp group or they did it through a call or I would use other platforms like VoiceThread, for example, where they could go together, read and record themselves. So I use different tools in order to do group reading and group listening. But I made sure that I was connecting them sound somehow and not only through a breakout room. We also did skits and role plays. And for skits and role plays, we used different tools in which they would create their own role play. They would practice it and they, and they could practice it in two ways. They could either practice it in a breakout room or they could practice it through a phone call. That they, they would a three way phone call with their phone or with their WhatsApp. And then they would practice that way. And then we would present it on the plenary in the Zoom call. Then we also had whole group discussions that is regular and normal or we could do polls and then they would answer in the chat or people would open their, their microphone and they would be able to provide their input and their thoughts on the topic that we were discussing. Now, something that is key and something that in my experience in all this online process that I found important was that activities had to be planned for 15 to 20 minutes maximum. If I went over that length of time, then I would start losing people. And, and, and I didn't want that to happen, right? Because I wanted them to be engaged. So I limited my activities. Even if the block had 40 minutes, I would divide the block into 15, 20 minute actions that we were doing. And we were changing things all the time. So I think I felt that these sessions were successful because of that, because I was giving those short blocks of time to keep their attention spans for those particular activities that we were doing at that time. So these are examples of what a, a, a lesson would look. And so here you see, even, if, even though I have a big block over here, these were divided into 10 minutes, things that they were doing, the activities that they were using, and the resources that they were using. So this, is, this would be sort of, of a lesson in how, in how that would look like. That would be an example. And, and I, but I made sure that even if I had a big block of an hour, I would divide that with different things and different topics within the things that we were doing. What are the tools that I used? Well, I like and I enjoy very much uh, the Google suite of tools because it provides for me a way. And, 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 and when I got feedback from teachers and from students, they said, I like that system because I, I feel, and I will explain to you uh, what they felt. But, but first, let me tell you about the Google suite. So I use the Google Docs. I use the Jamboards. I use the Google Slides. And I use Google Spreadsheets uh, to uh, engage them in different activities. So, for example, I would use a Google Spreadsheet to divide them in groups and then give them links of places that they would read. And then they would leave the observation in the last column based on questions that I would ask, for example. I would use the Google Slides for them to, uh, to, to help them create three to five minute presentations, and I would give them the exact number of slides that I wanted them to use and guiding questions or guiding statements in the, in the Google Slides, and they would do them as a group. I would use the Google Docs, for example, to um, organize a reading uh, that is scrambled, and they would organize it and put it or in order, analyze it, and then answer the question. So, and then we would use the Jamboard either to uh, listen to a lecture that I would give them, or for them to provide input to a topic, the topic that we were discussing. So there were different things that we would do with the Google suite of tools. Then we would also use short videos, either three to five minute videos, 10 minutes maximum, and, 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 if, and if, if it was a longer video, 10 to 15 minute uh, video, I would stop it in between and we would have a conversation of what was going on or predicting what was happening in the next minute. And then we did short readings or excerpts. We would do uh, readings of articles that could be 
maybe two to three pages long or short expert excerpts that were four paragraphs. And, and also what I would do is I would have different groups have different parts of the article and then we would put them together through a conversation of the article. So those were some of the things that I was using uh, during, during this uh, process of online engagement in virtual settings. Some of the other tools that I used were Mentimeter. And Mentimeter was very good, especially for the aspects of uh, taking uh, a quick assessment or taking a poll or taking the polls of how things were going or determining whether the students were, uh, were needed more information on some topic or whether the teachers needed more engagement in some of the areas. Also, um, I would... Uh, Sorry, I would uh, use the Padlet, uh, it, and we use the Padlet for different things. We used it for introductions. We used it uh, to discuss a topic. We used it for a final reflection. Uh, in in one case, I used it for a final portfolio, where they would talk about the whole experience throughout the whole course. We use Flipgrid, and Flipgrid is good, and we're going to do an example with Padlet and Flipgrid. And Flipgrid uh, worked very well because we were able to have teachers, for example, in, in, in a professional development course that I was teaching, I would help them um, create a, a, a reflection on how they were using the materials, for example. And if if that was uh, important to them and what they, how they implemented it in the classroom and what were the things that they were doing uh, that, were, uh, that were working well and that were uh, important for their students and their feedback from their students. So that we would use a Flipgrid for that. And what I liked about the Flipgrid is that they did their video and then I had the students and their partners comment on their, on their, on their videos. Then we also use VoiceThread, which uh, provides that important uh, aspect of having uh, a video or a reading and then having comments all around. That's a good tool to use. We use Nearpod. We used it mainly for assessments, but I will show you that Nearpod, when I show you the tool, I will show you that the Nearpod helps because it has a library of resources of materials that are already done. And that's good for teachers because we have a very huge workload and we want things that are already done and they are free and they are available and ready to use, but you also have the possibility of adapting those. Then we use TED Talks and we use TED Talk Lessons. Those were useful as well. We use YouTube videos and we also engage through Facebook groups and that in Facebook groups I find it really useful because you can add a lot of materials uh, that could help your students uh, develop or all their uh, language skills. Okay, so I'm good with time and then I will like to try this. So let's try and see what you think about these things that we used. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my presentation and I'm going to go to the chat and I will ask you to go to the link that I'm posting there. And over there, I'm going to ask you to post about two things. You are going to, you have over there, you can either record your voice or you can record a video. It's up to you what you want to do. And I'm going to give you five minutes to do that. You just need to go to the link and join. It's, it's open for whoever uh, wants to join with that link. And I'm asking you to do two things. I'm asking you to, uh, and I'm going to show you. I'm asking you to do two things. How do you pronounce your name? And what is something we should know about you? And then the responses are going to start appearing here. Okay? So I'm going to give you five minutes to do that. And not everybody has to do it if you don't want to do it, but at least one person should do it so that we can see how it works. And I'm going to give you five minutes.
and let me know if you're trying that or if you're having trouble with it. If that doesn't work, then use this code over here and see if that works. And that takes a little bit more time because it's recording and you can do it with your phone. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to give you time to do that. So I'm going to I'm going to be quiet for the next because it's difficult for me to be quiet as a teacher. <laughs> but I'm going to be quiet for the next 3 minutes and let you try that. So I can see the people there. That's good. So that means people have been able to log in. And then here we have Lucinda, can we play yours? Yep. Okay, perfect. I will share again with sound. And then I'll show you what Lucinda did. Hello, everybody. My name is Lucinda Estrada. Uh, you pronounce my first name as Lu Sin Da. And one important thing you might want to know about me, I suppose my job, I work at Sun Sun Hyang University and teach general English courses. Perfect. So that's what uh, the recordings would look like from your students. And then what we can do is like if we want to uh, say something to Lucinda, we can add a comment, okay? And, and this is for teachers. I can do many things here as a teacher, but then I could add a comment to Lucinda's, uh, to Lucinda's video and tell her, thank you, Lucinda, for letting me know how to pronounce your name. You know, uh, it's sometimes difficult to pronounce different names from different uh, people from different countries, right? I could, I could leave a comment like that. So those are things that you can do with the tool. Let's move on to the other one. And here we have my Cotiso co Padlet. And you will see that I have already added an example there. So that's my cartoon. And then I tell you, I feel excited to see such an engaged community of teachers working together to thrive. And it's open to everybody to write there. I'm going to give you the link to that. And I want you to uh, give me your, give me your, uh, what are you excited about today? And I'm going to leave this in the chat for you to add. And this one is easier, right? You just uh, write something. You don't need to add a photo if you don't want to, but you can. You could add video if you wanted to. When, when you go to the add here, 
it tells, it lets you do many things. I don't want to close this. It lets you do many things, and you can see it lets you add files. It lets you add a photo of you yourself right now, or it lets you add videos and other things. It lets you add links. It lets you add images from the internet or from your computer, and it lets you change the color of the background of your comment. And you can either do it anonymously if you don't log in. In that case, if you're going to let your students do it anonymously, you might want to ask them to leave their name at the end, right? And if you, or it could be something that you require questions anonymously, you just let them do it anonymously because you're just making a survey of what are the areas in which they need more work, right? And they can do it that way. So I'm going to give you again three minutes. For you to leave a message, what are you excited about, about this conference that has just started for you? Excited to learn about new tools to use in the virtual classroom. Nice. Close this. Excited about learning new things and meeting new people. Nice. And you see, this one is easier, right? Because it's only writing. But you could also have your students record a video and then upload the video here to the Padlet too. Padlet lets you do that too. And in the basic, uh, basic, uh, uh, you have different uh, types of, of um, packages that you could use. The basic package allows you to have three Padlets. That means that when you're not using a Padlet anymore, you would have to delete it. But if you pay a little bit more, you can have access to 10 Padlets or 20 Padlets or unlimited Padlets. It depends. Nice. Ryan says, I'm excited to learn about new tools to use in the virtual classroom. The more we can help each other, the more effective we can all be. Love that. And then I'm excited to learn new ways to engage students online. Love that cartoon. <laughs> Perfect. OK, so you see. Padlet is very intuitive to use, very uh, nice to uh, use for engagement with your students. And like I said, I used it in different ways. I used it to discuss topics. I used it for introductions. I found that it was, instead of having people go around in the classroom saying, my name is, and da, 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 I would have them go into the Padlet and I would say, take two to three minutes and introduce yourself. And that would create that they, it will lower their effective filters about introducing themselves for the first time in a new group, for example. So I found it to be very engaging, a very engaging tool. Great. Let's get to the next tool that we're going to experience today. And this is a TED Talk lesson. Now, TED Talks, TED Talks, TED, sorry, TED Talks lesson I like because there are things that are already done for you. And then I chose one that I found uh, interesting, and it's usually for kids. And, but it's things that are already done for you. And what you do is you can either use it as is, or you can go into customize the lesson and make it your own. And that is the questions that you want to, to use. Here you will see that there are already questions that are already done. And maybe those are helpful for you, but maybe they're not. So if you don't like those questions that the TED Talk lesson already has, you can go ahead and customize it. And it's going to stay there and it's going to be available for a teacher. So you're not only helping your own classroom, but you're helping other teachers in other parts of the world. Then the dig deeper part I like because it's you have the TED Talk, and you have the video that the students listen to, but then you also have additional information and places that they can go and look for extra information about the topic. And then you have the discussions where you and you see here that there's a teacher who already created. This is a teacher who created the lesson and this is available for discussion and there there's one guided discussion and then there, there are other open discussions that other teachers have created around that and you can have the students create that discussion so that's valuable because then you uh, have the students take ownership of their own learning so what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to let you watch the ted talk video about why uh, if what, what would happen if you stop brushing your teeth forever and then we're going to go through the questions and see how that goes 
From twigs to electrical toothbrushes, humans have been cleaning our teeth since the ancient Egyptians in 5000 BCE. But what if you just straight up stopped brushing your teeth at all for the rest of your life? Within minutes of stopping, the food debris and moist environment from Sorry, okay. is one of the most common bacteria found in our mouth, and it's normally not harmful until it metabolizes sugar or protein from food debris. But after a full day, these bacteria would have already produced significant amounts of plaque from sugars. Plaque is the slimy layer of biofilm that you can feel on your teeth when you accidentally forget to brush sometimes. And this plaque actually helps the bacteria adhere to your teeth, which allows them to produce even more plaque, creating a cycle of bacteria and plaque buildup. After a week, all this buildup will cause some pretty serious bad breath. Not to mention that the plaque begins to harden and form tartar that lead to your teeth appearing yellow. At this point, you're also causing significant damage to tooth enamel as the bacteria break down sugar to produce lactic acid. Enamel is the hard, mineralized outer layer of the tooth, and once it breaks down, you can't make any more. After a month, your decaying teeth will form cavities. These holes in your teeth get deeper and deeper if left untreated, leading to gingivitis, an early form of gum disease. This is because the immune system attacks your gums and teeth in response to the bacteria buildup. Your cavities will fill up with pus, which is a protein-rich fluid filled with dead white blood cells, and your gums will be extremely sensitive at this point, turning red when you touch it and bleeding with any significant pressure. After an entire year of neglect, you now have periodontitis. The inner layer of the gum and bone are broken down by enzymes and pull away from the teeth to form pockets, which only further allow collected food debris and bacteria to gather. This causes the immune system to go into overdrive and destroys your gums and ligaments, resulting in advanced periodontitis where your teeth become loose and begin to fall out. Any longer, and the issues can spread beyond your mouth and into your blood, causing inflammation throughout your organs and increasing the likelihood of erectile dysfunction, head and neck cancer, chronic heart disease, and even dementia development. Combine your lack of brushing with a poor diet, high in processed foods, and especially sugar, which is much more common now than early homo sapiens would have experienced, and you have a much more accelerated breeding ground for bacteria, putting your whole body's health at risk. Brush your teeth, kids. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any burning questions, flaming questions that you want us to answer. And now we're all going to go brush our teeth, right? <laughs> so let's uh, go into the chat and I will write the link over there and you can go to the think part and I'm going to give you two minutes to answer the questions, the pre-prepared questions that are over there and, and you can start, um, Take, take, see it, what, you what was your takeaway from the video. So I'm going to give you two minutes to do that. It's only five questions. And we're not going to ask you for your results, but this is what you would do with, with your students. Great. I hope that you enjoyed that lesson. And then, like I said, with your students, you could go into the dig deeper part or create your own discussions or have your students create your, your discussions. If you can see here, we can use the lessons that are, are already done for us. They, uh, Ted Ed also has a blog. 
we could create a lesson from the videos that Ted has. We could also be part of their educator or student talks and we could also uh, donate or, or shop, right? So this, this is Ted Ed. I really like it and my students really enjoy it. I especially like the fact that it's up to date content that we can use and, and that's always important, right? Because we don't want to have updated uh, content. And then our last activity for the day is our Nearpod. And then Nearpod I have used a lot for assessment, but like I said, and I will show you after we do the assessment, we can use it also. And let me stop sharing here because it's not letting me get the link. Uh, we can use it also for the purpose of um, creating uh, lessons for our students, but we can also use it for very quick assessments. And I'm trying to look for the, the code for you to use. Sorry about that. And it's here. I'm going to copy the code. And then you just go to nearpod.com and just use that UPAGY link that I just posted on the chat. I'm going to share my screen again. For those who don't have access to the chat, this is our code. Just go to joinnearpod.com and then use that Upagi uh, code over there. And then join the game. When we see one or two plays join or the, joining the game, then we're going to uh, begin. We'll see who joins. There we have Lucinda, very good. We're gonna wait for some more people to join. We have Andre, very good. I'm gonna wait for two more people to join in order to start. And it's not long, it's only two questions, but what I want you to see is how the tool works. And then I will show you the library. We have Dixon, good. One more person and then we can start. And then and you can choose your character and that's fun. And it's fun. And let me tell you, it's not fun only for kids. I've done this with adults and they like it. It's like, I like the character. So, <laughs> so it really depends because we're young at heart, right? Okay. Okay. Let's begin with Lucinda and Andre and Dixon. And we're, I'm going to start the game and you should see pop up in your, in your uh, device, the questions uh that you are answering and we can see there someone already responded one question correctly two questions correctly three questions correctly very good then we have 15 seconds on the clock still 10 seconds there we go to the next one and then we see the next question very good and then everybody responded. And here you can see that it's not really about uh, whether you respond a right or wrong answer because you get your feedback that you got it right, but you have to be quick, right? And then we see over there the score, right? So that's, that's I, I like that about, about Nearpod. And you can do it as fancy as, as you want it to do. You can also go here, and if you want, you don't want uh, to see the students' names, you can hide them. Like I said, sometimes you want to do the same things with the names. Sometimes you want to do them anonymously, and that's good too. If we go to the library, okay, I'm going to leave this session. If we go to the library, and I want to show you there, the Nearpod library, you see here that there is a lot of content and you see here that there are lessons, videos and activities, that there are lessons for the different subjects, that you have it for all grade levels, including, including higher ed education. And you see here the tons of lessons that, that are, we, you have the ones that are featured, the ones that are used the most, uh, for example, Financial Literary Month, the National Poetry Day, Ramadan right now, Passover, holidays, right? And then you have videos, 
you have activities, you have the lessons. And I, what I like about Nearpod is that it also has tutorials that help you. If, if you look for tutorials, they help you learn how to use it to your best advantage. They also have a whole community where you can go and get access to uh, connect with other teachers and have a network of teachers that you can engage with. So I find Nearpod to be a good tool for engagement and to bring innovation into your classroom. And with this, I end my presentation and I hope that you have learned at least one new thing. And if you have questions, I am ready for those questions. Or if you have comments, I, I welcome those comments and feedback too. Thank you for listening to me today. And thank you for being here at the conference on a Saturday morning. <laughs>
I knew that they were working in a document and I could see them there actually interacting, even if I didn't see their faces in the camera, for example. I would see them working in the Google Slides or in the Jamboard or working in their Flipgrid. I would see that happen. So I would say that uh, the benefit was that level of engagement and having them on task, which is usually something that we usually battle with, right? When we are in person and when we are virtually. Thank you. And I agree with uh, Melvin that uh, mixing the platforms can keep students interested. Yes, definitely. Kahoot is very good. Kahoot is very similar to Mentimeter. Yeah. Well, there are many tools out there. It's like, wow. So, so what we do is we need to choose the ones that we think are going to benefit our teaching, right? So if nobody has any more comments or questions, I want to thank you for being here and I'm very happy to be virtually. I hope that next year I can be in person in Korea and say hi to everybody in person. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I think we all really got a lot out of this session and I think, are you going to be available for questions on Discord as well or no? I can be if you tell me how i had not programmed for that <laughs> but okay. i can if you let me know if you let me know how i can do that i have another session in 10 minutes in 15 yeah. minutes but i will be i can be available tomorrow on discord and and, and get the hang okay. of that i haven't used discord i have heard yeah. of it but haven't used it <laughs> <laughs> and we also have the email in the chat so thank you very much for that Yes, definitely. And and like I said, I it will take me a little bit to respond. Sometimes I'm quicker, sometimes it takes me a little bit, but I will respond definitely. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll let you get to your next session. <laughs>